distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, may we be upstanding for His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Kenya and the Commander-in-Chief of the Defense Forces. A lot of applause for His Excellency. Thank you. With your permission, Your Excellency, may we be seated. Your Excellency, the President of the Republic of Kenya and the Commander-in-Chief of the Defense Forces, the Secretary General, UNCTDA, the Director General, UNON, the Vice President, European Union and Commission, the Cabinet Secretaries, ladies and gentlemen. Your Excellency, allow me now to invite uh, the Honorable Peter Munya, Cabinet Secretary for Trade, Industry and Cooperatives, Kenya, to take us through the program, Your Excellency. Your Excellency, Uhuru Kenyatta, President of the Republic of Kenya, Secretary General of Anktan, Dr. Mukisa Kituji. Distinguished delegates, ambassadors and high commissions. Distinguished guests, lineage and gentlemen, may I take this opportunity to welcome His Excellency the President to this very important UN conference. Your Excellency, we want to thank you for joining us this morning for this very important event, the Africa Electronic Commerce Week. It provides us with an opportunity to dialogue on Africa e-commerce and digital economy. At the outset, let me acknowledge Your Excellency's leadership in this area. At the beginning of your presidency in 2013, you clearly pronounced that you will be leading a digital government. And you surely have done it. The interplay of trade and electronic technology has been acknowledged as critical in economic development and advancement in the 21st century. It is therefore critical that we seize the opportunity now to, sh to shape a future that will be beneficial for us in Kenya and Africa as a whole. This forum affords us the opportunity to acquire knowledge and learn from the experience of our trading partners to inform our policy choices design and direction. In response to your policy direction, my ministry developed the national trade policy that the cabinet in December 2016 approved. The national trade policy has underscored the role of e-commerce to Kenya's economic development. Further, my ministry has gone ahead to develop an electronic trade portal, e-trade portal, that will be instrumental in provision of trade information that will allow the business community to access quality trade information on markets, including the requirement to export to the specific markets. This will be useful for micro, small, and medium enterprises, which in most cases do not have sufficient resources to invest in collection of such information. The trade photo launched in October 2017 was developed in consultation with the private sector and the county governments to ensure that their needs were taken into consideration. Under the Big Four agenda, the role of the micro, small, 
and medium enterprises has been recognized as important in creating jobs for the youth and women. My ministry is committed to explore how to use technology to make these businesses make meaningful contribution to job creation and economic development of this country. At the multilateral level, there are discussions on how to integrate micro, small, and medium enterprises into the global economy. Electronic technology, through the use of various ecosystems, such as technology platforms, are considered as some of the best means of integration. We are consulting among ourselves in Africa to explore how best to approach the discussions so that we can engage from a position of knowledge and evidence that can best secure our strategic economic interests, both present and future, in the area of electronic commerce and digital economy. Angtan has done well to bring this conference to Africa. I hope it will help inform Africa's debate and decision on the way forward in e-commerce and digital economy. I wish, therefore, in conclusion, to thank Angtan, European Union, African Union, for, uh, and, and all the other institutions that have collaborated in making this conference a success and a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Waziri. With your permission, Your Excellency, I now now must to invite the European Commission for Digital Single Market and Vice President of the European Commission, Andrews Ansip, to make his remarks. Let's appreciate him. Your Excellency Uhuru Kenyatta, President of the Republic of uh, Kenya, Honorable uh, Secretary General of uh, UNCTAD, uh, Mr. Mukisha Ketui, Honorable Cabinet Secretary uh, for Trade and Industry, Mr. Peter Munia, Your Excellencies, Ministers, Ladies and Gentlemen, it is a pleasure to be with you in Nairobi to open this first uh, e-commerce week in Africa. The European Commission is honored to co-host co this event uh, with our, our UNCTAD and African partners. I often talk about digital technology's power to drive economic growth and uh, development. The digital economy is the fastest developing sector in Africa. It contributes 10% of GDP. The mobile sector alone creates more than 3 million jobs. Digital technology helps to develop businesses, create growth, jobs, and opportunities, reduce social inequalities, and promote sustainable development. More digital will lead to more efficiency, to more transparency and accountability. In turn, that should mean less corruption and therefore a stronger socio-economic fabric. As others before me have said, growth and development should be as inclusive as possible in order uh, to embrace uh, the poorest and most marginalized in society. As it, uh, its close to neighbor and largest investor, uh, the European Union recognizes uh, these priorities in its uh, long-standing partnership with Africa. They are at the heart of uh, the Africa-Europe Alliance for Sustainable Investment and Jobs. The European Commission presented uh, this new economic partnership in September as a way to boost investment in Africa, to strengthen trade, create jobs, and invest in education and skills. It will make the most of uh, uh, the respective strength in Europe and Africa, and 
It identifies digital as a key economic area with energy, transport, and agriculture. As always, however, there is more uh, that we can do together. There are huge opportunities uh, that can benefit both sides, e-commerce in particular. In Africa, e-commerce is due to be worth 50 billion US dollars by end of this year, up from 8 billion US dollars five years ago. Online trading can help to make more goods and services available for African consumers, increase market access for SMEs, and encourage investments that in turn create more jobs. E-procurement is another good example. In Europe, several countries have saved a lot of money by digitizing their public procurement procedures. Sweden saved 20% of its costs by doing this. Portugal saved 18% of its hospital expenditures. These exciting digital opportunities also present a challenge for governments and policymakers who often struggle to get uh, the right laws and policies in place. They face issues like in, uh, inadequate infrastructure, a patchwork of uh, markets and laws, uh, poor uh, enforcement of data protection rules, and other trade barriers like uh, high taxes and customs duties. The EU faces several of uh, the very same challenges, like market fragmentation. Our 28 member countries have different uh, geographies and different challenges. We would be happy to share our experiences building uh, the digital single market uh, to support EU and African companies in carrying out business smoothly uh, between countries. As Africa builds its own single digital market, local SMEs will gain as national rules and uh, regulations come more into line and costs of cross-border parcel delivery are reduced. Just two examples. This e-commerce week is an excellent opportunity to start uh, reflecting together on the policy alignments needed to create an African single digital market. As always, Connectivity is essential. It is uh, the key to all things digital. Without proper online connections, there is no basis for digital progress. The rest, services, products, e-commerce, digital economies follow from there. According to the GSMA, digital divides around the world are greatest in sub-Saharan Africa. That is, despite the fact that mobile subscriptions are growing faster here than any other region. Mobile is used even in places with no electricity or water supply. By 2020, around half of Africa's population will subscribe to a mobile service, more than half a billion people. This shows that there is clearly no lack of demand. In Africa, mobile is the preferred platform for creating, distributing, and consuming digital products and services. For many people, mobile phones are not just communication devices. They are the main channel to get online. The problem lies much more with broadband access and infrastructure. Here, I would mention two short but vital words, access and affordability. Broadband internet is still unaffordable for many and rural areas tend not to be covered. The cost of buying a mobile phone also has to be within people's price range. All too often, 
This is not the case. To quote the GSMA, again, we need to look to factors uh, such as uh, sector-specific specific taxes and fees, high prices for data in some markets, in turn, made worse by relatively low income levels. The result is that many African countries have a real problem with overall service quality. At the same time, digital demand is immense. People can see for themselves how they can make digital access work for them, how it can improve their lives. Making sure people get access to affordable broadband connectivity and digital infrastructure is a key priority of the EU's Digital for Development strategy. For the first time, digital technology and services are an integral part of EU policy. On telecoms infrastructure, the EU is doing what it can in terms of investments. For example, we are investing in two fiber projects in West and Central Africa. Beyond this, we aim to use our know-how and experience to promote regulatory environments geared towards competition and protecting end-user rights. The EU supports countries uh, to put rules in place uh, uh, that are conducive uh, to investors, lowering heavy taxation and imposing uh, strong coverage obligations in return. That should help Africa startups and digital entrepreneurs uh, who face many barriers, not only regulatory, that prevent uh, them from scaling up. Ladies and gentlemen, I have always seen Africa as a continent of entrepreneurs. It is now going uh, through its own digital revolution that is reshaping uh, the continent. I firmly believe that Africa has a digital future full of opportunities and challenges with a great potential for investment and growth. In short, we want to support Africa on digital as much as we can. I wish you a successful e-commerce week. Thank you. With your permission, Your Excellency, sir, it's now my pleasure to invite the Secretary General of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, Dr. Moisa Ketui, to make his remarks and request Your Excellency, the President, to deliver his keynote address, Dr. Moisa. Let's appreciate Dr. Ari. Your Excellency, President Uhuru Kenyatta, your Excellency, the Director General of the United Nations Offices in Nairobi, my colleague Hannah Tete. Your Excellency, Andrus Ansip, the Vice President of the European Commission. Honorable Minister Peter Munya, Minister of Trade, and John Mosheru, Minister of ICT of the Republic of Kenya. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, may I, on behalf of UNCTAD, bid you all welcome to this first ever e-commerce week for Africa. Your Excellency, two years ago in Nairobi, at UNCTAD 14, we had two major outcomes related to what we're doing today. The first one was a calling from our member states that after 52 years of bringing the world to Geneva, we must look to bring Geneva and UNCTAD to the world. The second one was that we must now walk the talk about inclusion. And for us, it meant that we have to be innovative in how we can address the moment's challenges with the possibilities of today. Since Nairobi, Your Excellency, the Nairobi Maafikiano, the outcome of that conference, has become so popular globally that some of us fear the word Maafikiano will be patented the way Hakuna Matata was. <laughs> but today, we come here two years later, first celebrating an offshoot immediately out of Nairobi, when we established the E-Trade for All initiative with member states, with UN agencies, international corporations, civil society organizations, 
yesterday and in the course of this week was celebrated the arrival of 30 members of this family with the signing in of Cuts International and the United Nations Glo uh, Capital Fund, the Capital Development Fund. As one of the activities under this initiative, Your Excellency, we started a program of diagnostic studies in least developed countries on what is the state of play in the digital economy. What are the regulations like? What's the payment system like? What are the skill development programs like? What consumer protection laws do you have? A number of challenges come up. But unfortunately, when we've been looking at these challenges, we've been looking at them in Geneva. The fastest growing international conference that we host as an organization is the e-commerce week that we host in the spring every year. And this year, as the world came to Geneva, and we talked about half of humanity now being online, 500 billion people. We also talked about the reality that there's a continent where three quarters of the people are not online. And it was therefore natural in keeping to the call of Nairobi that we come to the people and in keeping with our priorities about where the message should be delivered that we look to have the first e-commerce week for Africa launched this time. I want to express our appreciation to the government of Kenya for again coming to our support. Excellence, when I came to you before Act 14, you gave us the material support and the logistical support to pull off a very successful conference. Similarly, after our decision in Geneva, I came to you again, and you gave us monetary and other support to host this meeting here. I want also to express our appreciation to our largest financial supporter, the European Union, ably represented here by the Vice President of the European Commission and the Government of Germany for this partnership. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, many times we are celebrating that e-commerce is growing, that the digital economy is growing globally. In fact, even some are saying Africa is doing very well because the growth of digital economy in Africa at 18% per annum is now largest in the world. But where are you starting? It may be true that today there are 21 million Africans who are buying services on the, on, online. It may be true that every month 134 million Africans are visiting Facebook. But even more true that there are virtually no services being sold online from Africa of a significant nature. That African produce in the villages, in the communities, in the women groups that are producing have no electronic market visibility. We need a dialogue where those who have been successful can help others, where those who are leading by example can demonstrate to the others what is possible. We cannot celebrate that Africa is doing well when 50% of all the digital economy of Africa is owned by Kenya, South Africa, and Nigeria. The rest of the continent out there needs to be also part of this story. I want to thank the government of Kenya for exemplary efforts. Uh, many people in the world only talk about Safaricom as uh, M-Pesa. The reality is there's a very vibrant digital economy that goes on there. There are some interesting policies of government to support, and I want to express appreciation to the minister. For example, the establishment of a network of universities where government is helping them in the digital space to create jobs. And as I've shared with him, we encourage him and other countries that while you link up with the school institutions of learning, also link up with the young entrepreneurs who are already creating jobs in the digital economy. They can be very, very important deliverer on the promise of inclusion. Excellencies, the African continent needs concrete progress and solidarity with the world. The world is talking about the importance of e-commerce. We know that digital economy is growing at 12% per annum and the rest of the trade, digital trade is growing at 12%, and the rest of trade is growing at only 3%. But how does the world help Africa to get on board? One, today, all aid, aid for trade support to developing countries, only 1% goes to the digital economy. Today, all the multilateral development banks put only 1% of their resources in ICT-related services. And even of that 1%, only 4% goes to policy area interventions and support. We want our partners to walk the talk also. Put resources into building the ecosystem for Africa to use the opportunity that e-commerce represents. We want 
to use this opportunity from Nairobi to mobilize political will by leaders of governments, ministers present here today, development partners here today, to see the critical urgency of playing catch up before it's too late, addressing the digital divide that is ever growing every day, addressing skill content development institutions for preparing the next generation of African young men and women to be the creators, to be the content developers, to be the services providers of the world. It's in this regard, Your Excellency, that I'm very happy that you personally took time off at a time of major preparations for your National Day celebrations, not only to support us, but to come personally and be with us. And we appreciate this very much. And we hope that your colleagues around the continent will hearken to your message that Africa cannot afford to misstep again. And with those very many remarks, it's my distinct pleasure to invite His Excellency, the President of Kenya, to address you. Uh, thank you very much. Please be seated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the Secretary General of uh, UNCTAD, and my dear brother, Dr. Mukisa Kitui, Mr. Andres Ansip, the Vice President of the European Union, my sister, Hannah Tete, Director General of UNON, all our development partners, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Let me begin by saying how delighted I am to join you all at this opening session of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, Africa Regional Electronic Commerce or E-Commerce Week. This forum is a major milestone event for UNCTAD and for Kenya, since it's the first time that the forum is being held in Africa. And we in Kenya are honored to have been asked to host this very important event. I take this opportunity also to welcome all the delegates to our beautiful country, Kenya. The theme, as we have been told, of this forum, empowering African economies in the digital era, is a theme that could not be more appropriate, digital technology can and will greatly contribute to the advancement, first and foremost, of the continent's economic and trade agenda, because as you're all aware, this year in March, in Kigali, Rwanda, during our African Union Summit, many of our African countries signed up to the Af agreement on the Africa Continental Free Trade Area and this agreement aims at bringing together all our African economies to form a single continental free trade area. For this to happen, digital technology is critical in order to enable Africa realize her objective of promoting intra-Africa trade by easing and accelerating cross-border communication, but also payments. Ladies and gentlemen, for Africa to benefit from e-commerce and the digital economy, the policy environment has to be conducive. And it is therefore of utmost importance that appropriate attention should be given to this sector. In this regard, I consider it more than appropriate for Africa to begin a meaningful debate and engagement on e-commerce and digital economy, focusing, just as a starting point, on policy areas identified by the UNCTAD e-Business Readiness Assessment Program that was launched in 2016. The policy areas identified by this initiative include, amongst other things, assessing the readiness of countries to engage in e-commerce and the digital economy, to ensuring adequate and affordable information and communication technology infrastructure, to facilitating payment solutions for cross-border e-commerce, to adapting trade logistics 
to the digital era, but also to protecting consumers online and the privacy of digital platform users. It will also involve building skills for digital economy and also improving access to finance for startups and growing businesses in the digital sector on the African continent. Ladies and gentlemen, my government has been in the front line in promoting the use of digital technology to enhance the delivery of services to our citizens. This, I believe, is evidenced by the substantial investment that we have put over the years in the development of information communication technology information, such as our fiber optic network, connection between Kenya and the rest of the world, as well as the development of the national digital infrastructure that connects all our 47 counties and sub-counties. The objective here has been to reduce the cost and time taken by our citizens and our businesses to get government services. This has seen enhanced use of technology to file taxes through our iTax platform, the issuance of government documents such as passports and visas through the e-citizen platform. And I can equally not fail to underscore the now world-famous M-Pesa money transfer services, an, an innovation that has put Kenya on the global technology map. This innovation has revolutionized money transfer services and improved financial coverage to Kenyan citizens who could not be reached by conventional banks and other financial service providers. I want to assure you that my administration will continue to promote such technology innovations by ensuring conducive policy environment, which balance between innovation and regulation to ensure that Kenya remains ahead in ICT. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now widely agreed that the rapid rise of electronic commerce and the digital economy are transforming the way in which people and businesses interact. Digital economy or digital technology is virtually transforming every aspect of our lives and will continue to do so in the years ahead. It is however important to note that digital transformations also bring various challenges and costs. To cope with these challenges, calls for more effective collaboration among all stakeholders, coming with ways to retain labor so as to fit into the new skills, into the new skills that are required. And indeed, governments in Africa need to recognize the need for this collaboration to enhance the readiness of their economies to participate in e-commerce e -commerce and digital economy. Knowledge obtained from events such as the one we are participating in this week is therefore indispensable to each and every one of us. During the Africa Union e-commerce conference held in July 2018 here in Nairobi, substantial efforts to enhance the understanding of e-commerce and the digital trade landscape in Africa were made. The conference recommended that a two-pronged strategy be considered to avoid premature de-industrialization. It recommended that we encourage traditional manufacturing and that we digitize manufacturing. In addition, it was agreed that market information and intelligence were critical to foster trade opportunities across the African continent. This should be supported by smart policies, including targeted skills development that is necessary to protect and advance the interest of African entrepreneurs as well as emerging businesses. Therefore, Africa's agenda for, for integration, industrialization, structural transformation, and economic diversification can be enhanced through digital technology. 
removal of barriers to digital technologies is therefore a key necessity. Ladies and gentlemen, as my administration progresses in implementing what we now call our Big Four Agenda, manufacturing being one of the pillars, these elements of digital economy will be instrumental in planning for the industries of the future. And I therefore look forward to getting more ideas that can strengthen our resolve to enhance our manufacturing sector, a sector that we wish to be competitive and that will remain sustainable in a digital economy. Ladies and gentlemen, this time Africa must seize every opportunity to secure its rightful place. And Africa must jealously guard against being marginalized in the designing and setting up of global rules for e-commerce. Africa should build her digital knowledge base and engage on this basis to ensure that any development of disciplines in e-commerce has a development content that advocates the future of Africa's integration and industrialization agenda through the digital economy and in line with our African Union vision 2063. As I conclude my remarks, I wish to thank the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development the African Union and the European Union, and especially my friend Mukisa Kitui, for your commitment to development of Africa and indeed the entire globe through trade. I want to thank all our partners for their collaboration in the organization and hosting of this important forum. And I also wish to thank the E-Trade for all partners, the e-commerce forum Africa, the business for e-trade development, for their valuable contributions to the current discussions on digital economy, which I believe will inform Africa's choices or which path that we need to take to the digital economy and e-commerce of the 21st century. I wish you all very fruitful deliberations that will deliver Africa on the path to the future. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. I request that we be upstanding for His Excellency will take his leave. Thank you. Let's appreciate His Excellency. Ladies and gentlemen, please do be seated. Thank you so much for your attention. We move now to our next session, ladies and gentlemen, where we are focusing on how to ensure that digitalization brings inclusive development to Africa. This is a ministerial and CEO roundtable. Can I welcome all our panelists to come up and take their seats? Um, Cabinet Secretary Peter Munya, I believe, has headed out, but be, will be with us um, in just a moment. If I could ask Minister Amar Talat to please kindly make his way up here. Richard Okore Okello, please, Assistant Commissioner, do make your way up here. Malcolm Johnson, kindly do come up and take your seat. Frank Mastart, 
of Trademark East Africa. Chris Folayan, Chris, I see you right here. Do come up. Thank you very much. Nicholas Martin, please make your way up and take your seat. Dylan Piatti, please do join me up here. Anna Ekeledo, please come up and take your seat. Alan Rakatungu, please join me up here. Jessica Anuna as well, please join me up here. Let's take our seats for the next session. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, we are getting started. Some very interesting speeches to kick off the morning. Uh, we must walk the talk about inclusion when we're talking about the digital economy. Um, Africa is a continent of entrepreneurs, and so how do we unleash that potential through e-commerce? So a lot to talk about, and a few more panelists will join us in a short while, but I'm going to get started um, with the panelists that we have as we look at the barriers that we have uh, to facilitate domestic and cross-border uh, e-commerce in Africa, as we look at the solutions, the measures, that we need to take and adopt to address those barriers. We're also going to examine the scope for value addition. What should we be doing when it comes to value addition in the digital sector in African countries? And then we want to ask ourselves, what policies do we need in place? And I think that's the most critical outcome for this session is the policies that we need. Um, so I'm going to get started. And um, I think Malcolm Johnson, Deputy Secretary General of ITU, I will begin with you. Malcolm, take us through the role and responsibility of ITU and the space that you have in ensuring that we can facilitate domestic and cross-border e-commerce in Africa, please. Thank you very much, uh, Julie, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to be here with you. Uh, so first of all, let me thank uh, UNCTAD for inviting ITU to, uh, to join this uh, very important uh, first e-commerce Africa uh, week. And uh, I'm sure this audience doesn't uh, need any persuading as to the importance of access to the digital economy for social, economic, and environmentally sustainable uh, development. But clearly, to benefit from that, you need to be connected. And uh, this is the uh, issue that we are most uh, concerned with in the ITU, because clearly connectivity uh, brings with it tremendous benefits, as we all know, not just for access to the digital economy, but also for e-education, for better health uh, care, for improved uh, productivity, and uh, for opportunities for, for innovation. And uh, just last week, ITU published its latest statistics on connectivity, which shows that now we've gone over 50% of the world's population connected to the internet. But of course, that still leaves almost 3.9 billion people not connected. And in Africa, um, it's... Uh, 
only around 24% uh, of the population that is connected. And of course in the LDCs it's uh, less than that. The, uh, the good news is that the rate of increase of connection uh, to the internet in Africa is the highest of any other region, and, and that's of course because of the tremendous uh, growth of the mobile um, subscriptions in, in Africa. Uh, the problem is bringing this connectivity to the uh, rural and remote areas, uh, as we've heard from the president. Uh, that's the, the big challenge, and that's a challenge because, um, because of the terrain, uh, but also because of the sparse populations. It means that the return on investment is so much poorer than it is for the urban areas. This is why we need uh, certain measures to be taken. Uh, of course, public-private partnership uh, is one of the most important, but we also need to have more incentives for investment, more tax incentives. We need to have uh, competitive pricing. We need to allow operators to uh, share infrastructure. And we need to make better use of the uh, universal service funds. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. Just to rush you along a little bit, um, we do have ministers on our panel. We have government representatives here today. To focus you, if you were to highlight one policy shift that you would like to see, what would that, what would that shift be? One of the, uh, the biggest uh, problems besides uh, connectivity is the fact that um, there isn't the incentive to connect. So people have to be persuaded as to why it's to their advantage to spend the money to get connected, to buy the phone, to, get, to pay the service connection charge. So uh, it's a question of uh, awareness of the benefits, but then uh, you need the local content as well. People will only connect if there's a local content which benefits them. So we need to also develop the digital skills in order to develop that, uh, that um, content. So digital skills is the key, I believe, and what we need to ensure is that digital skills are included in the school curriculums, and also that we do more to encourage girls and women to enter into uh, the sector, the ICT sector, and to develop these skills that will empower them. Uh, and unfortunately, we see a, a large gap between the number of men and women connected Right. in the world, but unfortunately in Africa, it's a growing gap. It's even larger and it's growing. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. And, and, you know, with that introduction from Malcolm, I really want to come to move to experiences, people who are on the battlefield, so to speak, of e-commerce. And, and so uh, with that, the first person I want to call on is actually Jessica Anuna. So Jessica, if I could ask you to come here and actually take the podium. Jessica is a startup based in Nigeria. She's also, I believe, part of the incredible program launched by Untad and Jack Ma to build young entrepreneurs in this field. Jessica, I want to hand over to you with the questions, what is your experience, what are the barriers you face and what are some of the measures that could address these barriers? Over to you. Good afternoon everybody. Um, so as a young company and a startup operating on the continent of Africa, one of the main barriers that we um, are experiencing is inter-African trade. So inter-African trade is a developing economy and the infrastructure for the ease of trade across African borders isn't yet in place, unfortunately. So we believe that creating an enabling environment for trade between African countries can drive economic growth and boost the economic standing of, the Afri of African trade as a whole. Currently for me as a retailer, it's cheaper for me to ship from certain parts of Asia to Africa than from Nigeria to certain parts of West Africa. And that shouldn't be the case. So the ease of doing business across African borders is something that we need to address on a policy level and also in terms of investment level too. Trade between African countries and the ease of movement across um, and the ease of movement of goods, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, will help to increase African exports, helping Africa to move forward and up the value chain as well. A revision of policies can create an enabling environment alongside increased investment in transportation, telecommunications infrastructure, and road networks will result in one day Africa being at the forefront of the e-commerce industry globally. 
So we're actually a fashion uh, startup based in Nigeria, and we ship to millennials all across Africa, and we've just entered the African continent. Surprisingly, we haven't really received a lot of um, uh, backlash or you know, difficulties actually entering the African continent, but the difficulties have been shipping to various parts of Africa. As I mentioned earlier, it's cheaper for me to ship from certain parts of Asia than within Africa itself, and that shouldn't be the case. So I look forward to uh, this e-commerce week discussing and reviewing policies to make intra-Africa trade uh, more accessible for startups like myself, and also to help boost the economic growth of Africa as a whole. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I actually have dabbled, or I try to dabble in the e-commerce space and face the same challenge. I'd just like to ask by a show of hands, anybody who's in the space already and who has that same challenge of moving, movement across the continent, would you please put your hands up? Let's see. Okay, that's a significant number of hands because a lot of people in this room may not be private sector, but we've already seen quite a few, quite a few hands go up. So that is well noted. I want to come now to more private sector perspectives, and I do understand that there was a CEO forum last night where a lot was discussed. And so, um, Dylan Piatti, if I could come to you now to kind of tell us, uh, amongst yourselves as, as CEOs, what did you discuss, what were the highlights, and what advice do you have in terms of policy directives for our government representatives here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, really excellent to be here. And as I move on to that, I must say that uh, we're fortunate to have a number of the CEOs on this panel. As part of that three-hour summit yesterday, um, we had Anna, uh, Nicholas, and Chris um, as part of that. And we had representatives from 22 uh, individuals from over 10 different countries on the continent providing the feedback from southern, east, west, central, and northern uh, Africa. And as you can imagine, it was quite a robust debate because there is no hom uh, hom homogenous view of Africa in terms of these challenges. But what we're trying to do is really pull out those common threads. Um, what we are saying is that from a national perspective, there are going to be specific country bound nuances. But in order to really promote uh, the accelerated and sustainable growth of e commerce and digital economy on the continent, uh, requires collaborative approaches. And as such, this was actually the first constituted uh, Africa CEO Digital Forum. Um, and from that, we have actually fleshed out a number of uh, different areas that we want to focus on. I'm not going to obviously go through those uh, now, and it's something that we are going to be presenting to, to the regional, uh, national, and, and, uh, and uh, uh, continental uh, governments. Um, what is important about this, though, is that there are commonalities that are coming out. You mentioned one now in terms of the movement across uh, the continent, the access uh, to markets as uh, in costs of doing business. Um, and what we would really like to see, and I, I suppose there are a lot of areas, but I think let me highlight one or two without going into a lot of detail. Uh, one of the areas around um, internet connectivity, which we all agree is the foundations for the growth of a digital economy on this continent is, other than, of course, the infrastructure development that is required uh, there, it's also the cost of that access. Um, but we also want to look at something like cross-border uh, data restrictions, which we believe are also an impediment. Um, we don't have a single view of customer. There's increased costs um, when you work with your customer, whether it's B2B, B2C, uh, B2G, which is business to government or government to business. Uh, it's very nation-bound uh, or national-bound. Uh, and we want to start planning towards the implementation of a pan-African one-cloud concept in regards to this. Uh, part of that is that we also think we need to have a pan-African, multiple stakeholder, private and public sector, um, digital economy uh, working committee to focus on how we can uh, leverage this for the future. Thank you very much. So a great suggestion there, a working committee that focuses on this issue. Chris uh, Folayan, CEO, Mall for Africa, I want to come to you now. Take us through your experiences of the barriers and the measures that you would be proposing that uh, be taken up to address those barriers, please. Thank you very much. Um, I think the barriers have mainly been around um, the infrastructure and getting the infrastructure rights, the internet penetration into different countries so they can actually experience e-commerce as it should be. Um, that has definitely been an issue. 
So we're in, in the CEO um, forum yesterday, we were talking about things that are pretty close to my heart, um, such as you know the internet connectivity, the quality of the uh, connectivity, also the accessibility and the cost of the accessibility. Some people, you know, they might have the smartphones. Um, we know how that has actually grown on, on the continent, but still the cost of getting online is pretty tough, and where they can get online in the rural communities has been pretty tough. So accessing a platform like ours and utilizing a platform like ours, ours has been hard. So for people to actually, you know, get online and experience e-commerce ha has been tough. Um, also, education has been has been something that we've seen lacking. Um, the ability to understand what you can do with e-commerce, um, the fact that it can help you grow a business, it can help you start a small a small entrepreneur um, enterprise business, or if you just want to use it for your own personal gain, um, people need to understand what e-commerce can do for them and how it can improve their lives. So I think um, those are some of the issues we've seen, but, uh, you know, we're, we're making some headway slowly but surely. Please take us through one actionable measure that, that you would be proposing be taken up to, to, to address the barriers you've just taken us through. Sure. Well, um, one of the barriers I didn't, I didn't talk about, but one that is very key is security and trust. Um, the, how would I put it? For anybody to make an online transaction, first of all, the very first thing they need to do is be informed about the product. And then the next thing they need to do is trust the product before a purchase is made. Nobody in this room will ever, ever, ever purchase a product online or from anybody if they don't trust that person. So getting that trust down is key. So, you know, it comes down to trust certificates online, trying to figure out some kind of establishing some kind of conformity and uniformity between different borders, um, be it intra-Africa or internationally, where people can go on a website and they know I can trust you even if I don't know who you are. So implementing some trust modules um, is, is key. Thank you so much for that. And I saw the Minister, Cabinet Secretary here, uh, Peter Munya, and Alan Mastart nod, nodding their head in agreement. And I'll, I'll be with you in a short while. I want to really tap into the entrepreneurs to get their experiences and, and really come back and, and from those who are facilitating from a development perspective or government perspective, the creation of this environment, your feedback, your thoughts. Um, let me come now to uh, Anna. Ekeledo, Executive Director of Africa Labs. Anna, take us through your learnings, your growth, your challenges, and the changes that you need to see to really make your business thrive. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I run Afri Labs, which is a network of innovation hubs across the continent. So we basically have um, about uh, 135 incubators and accelerators as members across 36 African countries. And basically what these hubs work to do every day is support entrepreneurs and startups on the continent build successful businesses, leveraging on technology. Now, in the e-commerce space, I mean, a, a study was done last year which showed that there were over 200 uh, ventures in, in the e-commerce sector. However, only 30% of them were barely profitable, right? And one of the challenges that was cited as a problem was a lack of funding. So what we need to see on the continent is more investment going into startups, but also more government incentives that actually encourage investors, both local investors, international investors, to invest um, in startups on the continent. So basically um, improving investment-friendly um, 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 laws and policies. Um, now, tech hubs basically, you know, provide a lot of support to startups, right? But then we face our own challenges as well. So, you know, the cost of infrastructure, for example, um, uh, 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 the cost of running a hub, and then just that partnership with various stakeholders. So we do need more stakeholders, includes, including the government as well, to invest in, 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 in the tech hubs across the continent. There are over 400 um, across Africa, and leverage on them as centers of excellence um, that build these entrepreneurs and startups on the continent, which will go ahead to create jobs, um, build successful businesses, and actually add to economic and social development on the continent. And one more thing is the lack of research as well. Um, 
I know member states in Africa have, contribute, have committed to contributing 1% of GDP to research, but that isn't implemented widely yet. Um, as a subset of that 1% of GDP, it would be great to see a more research going into this sector. So we do know that um, about 70 to 80% of, um, of businesses on the continent are in the informal sector. So we have MSMEs. Um, small businesses, basically. So how can we, you know, carry out more research, see how we can formalize and empower uh, uh, these businesses to engage in uh, cross-border trade, for example, through development of marketplaces, and how can the government support, how can we have more national, um, uh, regional, and continental research institutes that are focused on, you know, carrying out more on-ground research data into best practices and uh, uh, consumer uh, uh, values and you know so that when we have startups great startups coming up that want to build e-commerce businesses they have the research that um, is out there and being produced by these institutions and supported by the government and how can we incentivize more corporate organizations mm -hmm. um, to actually invest in research as well through let's say tax in incentives um, uh, in research, in funds dedicated to research. So, Thank yeah, you. so those are three main points. Support Bef tech hubs, um, investment um, incentives, and research, more research into the sector. Thank you, Anna. Before I leave you, I have a question for you. Um, uh, you mentioned 400 tech hubs across mm -hmm. Africa. Very interesting. Um, I would be interested to know, and you may not have this information, how many of them are actually linked to any academic institutions. But maybe the question I'll put to you now is what is that linkage between our academic institutions, tech hubs like yours, and again, you've highlighted research and development. What do we need to do to kind of align and bring all these things together, right? Yeah, so fantastic. We actually do have um, a tech hub uh, representative here from Ivy's Africa, which is part of Stratmore University. And they'll be having a session on Thursday, so it'll be great to be part of that to see more about the collaboration between tech hubs and universities. So basically, we do have more universities on the continent um, uh, that are setting up tech and entrepreneurship hubs, right? And basically, what they do is they support students that have innovative ideas to actually incubate these ideas within the hubs, right? On the other side, there's also research to practice. So looking at seeing how we can have more applied research, um, whether you're undergraduate, uh, master's, PhD research, um, to be more applicable to real social problems on the continent. Absolutely. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I think that's something we need to keep beating that drum, yeah. that we need to connect our, our, our education to yeah. the work and the skills that are needed in the marketplace. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Uh, very interesting. You know, you did uh, mention the need for funding, but I just want to tap into recently I was at the University of Cape Town Graduate Business School where they did a study. And um, actually they found uh, that the biggest need was not funding for many of the small startups they were studying, many of which were digital, the, actually the biggest need, uh, the biggest gap was that the product or service they were provided was not needed or was perceived as not needed by the market. And I think we need to start keeping that in mind. You know, how are we packaging what we're doing? What are we providing to the market? Um, Nicola, let me come to you now and your experience um, with uh, Jumia, which has been in the e-commerce space in Africa for quite a while now. Uh, as co-CEO, take us through your experiences, the barriers that you are facing, the challenges, and, and, and the measures that you would like to see to maybe address some of those challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. Um, first, a quick question, because I always do that when I go into countries. Do I have a lot of Jumia customers in the room? Or not that many? That's some, not bad. Some, some, That's yeah. even more raised hands than earlier. Uh, thank you for you. Uh, I usually, after I ask that question, when I exit, I get a lot of complaints about uh, late deliveries. So don't worry, I'll stick around for 10 minutes. Um, I think I... Uh, in the suggestions or the uh, ideas that I would like to, to propose, um, obviously they are coming on top of uh, what has been discussed in the forum yesterday and they are absolutely not contradicting. But what you will see most likely in the recommendation that the forum has made is that they're focusing on the, on the actions that will take the biggest impact. And as usual, the actions that are taking the biggest impact are also the longest to implement and the most expensive to implement. Building roads, connectivity, uh, it's a long-term fight and an expensive fight. I was curious and I was thinking coming here about what could be low-hanging fruits, actions that could be done right now that wouldn't cost much and that could help um, this effort. And I think 
The first is a notion of awareness of where the e-commerce and the e economy, the digital economy in Africa stands. To put it short, the digital economy is 25 years old in the West, it's six years old in Africa. Trying to copy-paste regulations or to think or through the frame of what you see with the GAFA and uh, the debates that are today happening in the European Union or in the US on how to regulate that industry, trying to copy-paste them as such right now would be suicide. Because you don't raise, I'm not a yet a father, but I guess there are a lot of parents that you have here, you don't raise a 25-year-old or you don't educate a 25-year-old the same way you educate a six-year-old. And I think just that notion of awareness by the regulatory bodies of being aware of what they're dealing with when they were dealing with the digital economy is, I think, the first thing that is crucial to me. I think the second thing and the second suggestion that I would have is to make different government and public organization aware of the amazing appetite there is globally for foreign investment to invest in the digital economy for e-commerce. I may say that I think Jumia is today the capitalistic vehicle, the most prominent capitalistic vehicle for uh, foreign direct investment in Africa in that industry. We have brought up around 400 million US dollars of investment through Jumia, uh, bringing uh, prestigious investors like Orange, AXA, Goldman Sachs, CDC, and others, and I'm sure they will be disappointed that I didn't quote them. Um, but those investors, they're eager to have more, but they also, they are cautious when it comes to Africa. And it wouldn't cost much for African governments and African uh, regulatory bodies to equip themselves with a decent PR, to organize roadshows, to see those investors, to tell them that it's not only Jumia that is coming for an idea of investment or other startups, but that actually there is a strong partnership with every local government and that local government and local um, organizations are committed to create the conducive environment that the president of Kenya was mentioning earlier. That message doesn't go through. Okay. International investors don't think that's the case. Okay, very quick question. So in, in, in order to de-risk or create a perception that there is a de-risking or mitigation of risk happening in this environment, what would you advise uh, some of the things that could be done? Go meet them. If you see, um, I'm, I'm French, so I know my, I have my more European reference point. But when there are big investments that are actually being done, you have... French Minister of Trade, French Minister of Investment that are actually meeting the most prominent investors or the most prominent CEOs and trying to explain to them their agenda about what they're trying to do for the Europe or for France. I don't think that message is passed along loud and clear as well in, uh, when it comes to Africa. And I think it doesn't cost much to do so and it would, it would greatly help. Okay. Create confidence and trust. Yeah. And, and the funds will flow. Thank you very much, Nicole. Uh, Alan, let me come to you now. Aaron uh, Rakatungu, CEO and founder of Exente Limited. I hope I've pronounced it correctly. Alan, uh, thank you very much. You're ish ish. Okay, you'll correct me. You're in the e-commerce space, the financial services space from Uganda. Please take us through your experience, both in Uganda and cross-border. What are the barriers you're facing and how can we best address those? What measures can we take? Thank you. Just press the, okay. the button, thank you. Yeah, um, when I saw the panel and I saw Jumia and the rest of the big boys, I knew I had made it. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Alan, you've never made it. Life is always a struggle <laughs> to the next step. Huh? <laughs> yeah, but anyway, um, so what are the barriers? Um, the whole notion of the digital economy, um, just the way it is, there are no borders, right? Um, and so Africa is 54 countries. And so what happens is that as we, we are now in Uganda and we have a fantastic product and um, we're actually, I think, one of the most popular in Uganda, but that doesn't mean, um, I don't want to say shit, but in the grand scheme of things, right? Um, so we are trying to scale now, but now, they are 54 different cultures, 54 different um, governments. Uh, th this, Africa is not one, you know, one country. It is many countries, and that is, I think, the, the biggest barrier. Um, but I liked what uh, the Honorable President was saying 
I think that's a step in the right direction. And though that is a barrier, there is also an opportunity for African entrepreneurs, right? Uh, because we understand the local landscape and we can navigate the local landscape. So though the different local countries are, you know, a barrier to, to e-commerce or a barrier to digital economy, because the digital economy only makes sense at, at scale, um, our understanding of the local ecosystem is also our opportunity. Thank you. If you were to ask for one measure that you require from the, the government representative sitting here, or even from any other uh, potential partners, what would that one key thing be? One, break down the country barriers, make it easy for us to uh, not only set up businesses in the different countries, uh, but you know, harmonize uh, regulation and policy and then stay out of our way. Don't impose any taxes and stuff like that. Okay. Let us do our thing. Yeah. Government must tax. Peter Munya is laughing. I'll come to him on that one. Um, uh, let, let me come to you next, Frank. And, and you know, you're squarely as trademark East Africa in this space. And can I just say, I, everywhere I go, I do commend trademark East Africa for remarkable work that they do. Uh, Cross-border trading, making things easier. But then I ask the question, you've made it a little bit easier from that, for that woman in Tanzania who produces fabric to come across the border and, and, and deliver her fabric to Kenya. But why on earth should she leave her children, get on a bus and cross the border? Why can't she trade via e-commerce? And that's the big question. So Frank, you've heard the perspectives of those in this space. You're here working hard in this space. Give us your, your thoughts. Thank you. No, thanks so much. And it's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, look, I, I, th I think I just wanted to say one thing first, is that the potential for e-commerce is great because it also reduces geographical barriers. We've got to remember that. But I, I think, um, you know, my colleague from Nigeria talking about her experience with her startup, I mean, there have been improvements in trade facilitation, but they haven't been even across the continent. And I, I do believe that here in East Africa, we've made some progress, but other parts of Africa, there's an issue. The CFTA, the, you know, the African Continental Free Trade Area, I think gives great opportunity. But look, in the end, I think we're talking about several things that need to happen in order for e-commerce to blossom. The first is trust. The second is reliability, because that's often a big issue. I think then the other thing is accessibility and affordability. Now, those outcomes need to be generated by a number of things. And I, and I think we, we, you know, if I look at East Africa where I work, we do have a number of policy frameworks to help e-commerce take off. But what we don't have is that at a cross-border level. Mm -hmm. And I think when you're talking about that issue of, you know, um, some of the women traders I work with, that's a problem, okay? So that doesn't exist. And that's something I think we need to do more on. I think the CFTA provides us with a great opportunity. I can see colleagues here from UNECA who are working on this, but that services trade aspect is really important. But even within the East African community, if I look at the member states, only about half of them actually have an, an enabling policy environment, which is what our colleague at the end there from Zente, if I'm pronouncing that right, said. So we need to get those policies in, in, in place. We also need to think hard about how we drive those outcomes and we need to think about how the CFTA can help with that process. But I think the other thing is, you've got to have something delivered. Trade logistics are still an issue. So you actually need the trade logistics to step up. And many of the countries that we work in, the trade logistics aren't very efficient. They're often cartelized or monopolies. These are things that we do need to look at. Um, I think the, so you know, what, I, what I'd sort of say is we need to think then how that small trader, Julie, can link up. And I think we need to think increasingly, not just about goods corridors unlocking goods trade, but digital corridors unlocking digital e-commerce trade. Without the policy frameworks at more of a regional level, that's not gonna happen. I mean, we, you know, His Excellency talked about M-Pesa, fantastic, but is it cross-border? You know, it's not, right. right? So how do cross, even cross-border payment systems are a real issue. So I think 
you know, to come to those outcomes of trust, reliability, accessibility, affordability, we need to unlock some of those policy frameworks and actually get trade logistics moving. And some of the things that my colleague from Nigeria is talking about, we actually need to allow goods to move across borders. The CFTA is a good opportunity for that, but it will take those efforts. Thank you very much. And, and just can I mention that we need to keep in mind that it is even more difficult when Anglophone Africa is trying to make payments and transfers and deal with Francophone Africa, Lusophone Africa. And those are some of the barriers that we need to simply break down uh, because it is a huge challenge for the continent. I come now uh, to the Uganda Experience uh, Assistant uh, Commissioner Richard Okore Okello. You've heard um, from everybody here and you've heard uh, your very own uh, Ugandan businessman, the one who is now one of the big boys as well, saying that, look, it's, it's such a challenge moving out of of this silo of ours, this country of ours, you know, how can you as, as government make it easier? And I know it's never easy moving with so many countries at one time, but how can Africa start getting this right? Please. Uh, thank you very much. Um, let me thank the organizers, ANCTAD, the EU, and all the other um, uh, institutions involved in um, holding this very important Africa e-commerce week. Let me also thank the participants. I think um, going straight to the question that you've been asking, I think my colleagues have already uh, overwhelmingly talked about um, the barriers. But I think um, one thing that you brought out very clearly is the issue of um, cross-border trade. I think we still don't have the infrastructure and the facilities that can enhance cross-border trade. I'll give you a typical example between Uganda and DRC Congo. In terms of even connectivity, first and foremost, the call rates and the data rates are too expensive to sustain any meaningful economic business. That is a serious barrier. I think within the EAC probably a lot has been done between Uganda, Rwanda, and, um, and, 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 and Kenya. But still, uh, when you go to Arusha, I think uh, the rate of interconnectivity is still quite um, prohibitive in terms of uh, doing business. But above all, I think let's look at the internal arrangements in terms of the basic infrastructure that are actually needed in order to enhance um, the E-trade. The e in terms of, if I order for a good, and I'm about probably a thousand in Gulu, about five, I mean 300 kilometers, and probably don't have even an address. How sure is it that I'm actually going to get the goods delivered to me? And actually, the right good that is ordered at the right time and in the right condition. So, those are the issues that I think we need to address in terms of um, policy um, uh, um, uh, uh, orientation. We need to address the issue of building trust the issue of ensuring that there is adequate insurance to cover the risk involved in transacting uh, the business, both domestically and also across the border. But also, how can we get those in the MSMEs involved in e-commerce? From my experience, what I've seen is that um, at the moment, the greater percentage of actually e-commerce is more oriented towards import than export. How can we, African countries, use the opportunity to promote export of our goods using the e-commerce platform? I think there's a lot that needs to be, to be done there. First and foremost, we need to build the productive capacities and to ensure that the quality of the goods that are actually going to be going in, onto the e-commerce platform meets the requirement of the market where they're going. Without that, we are still not yet there. We can have the platform, but if we still don't have the products and services to sell there, then we haven't done much yet. So I think a lot as we do is required in the other complementary uh, policies. Access to finance is quite critical. The issue of ensuring that we do a lot in terms of improving the quality of our goods and also addressing other trade-related logistics to improve on our competitiveness is going to be instrumental in ensuring that we actually gain Thank from you. the e-commerce um, um, 
uh, a trade. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Richard. I have not left you yet. I'm coming back to you just briefly. Um, I just want to put uh, postal service on notice, and, and uh, I will come to you on this very interesting example that has been shared of this person who lives in a very remote area. And perhaps in some of these situations, the only solution is the post office in some of these places. How can we use that? Um, I'll come to you in just a while. I, I, I want you, Richard, to just tell us, you've given us some of these challenges. You've talked about that re uh, person in a remote space. You've talked about insurance, building uh, productive capacity, curating the, the, the products and the contents and the services that we are going to provide. You've talked about access to finance. I want you just very quickly to tell me what you as government are doing in this arena, please. Uh, thank you very much. I think um, from Uganda perspective, a lot is being done in terms of improving first and foremost the road infrastructure also doing a lot in terms of improving the energy infrastructure, and then um, rolling out um, the key um, E-related regulations. We already have a couple in place, but still I think uh, we still need to do a lot more. But also fundamentally to ensuring that um, we actually have what we call um, a bottom-up approach in terms of uh, creating awareness right from school up to universities. We are already building quite a number of um, uh, incubation centers, project centers that is um, basically geared towards uh, promotion of uh, e-commerce related um, uh, transactions. Um, that is, I think, um, doing a lot. But we are also involving the private sector because I think they have a lot in terms of knowledge in terms of um, um, uh, reaching out to particularly um, hard to reach areas. I think uh, Sawiti Uganda is not, I mean Sawiti is not here. They have done quite a, a tremendous um, uh, effort in terms of bringing what they call online platform, which gives real-time information on procedures for clearance of goods, market prices, exchange rates and all that. And that has helped a lot in terms of uh, the SMEs because um, the platform that they're using actually uses the phone. You simply just dial, I think it starts something, 37 something, and then you get the information. So if you want to get to trade or with Kenya, uh, they have a specific number that you, you actually uh, punch on your phone. And, and you, you get, get the, information. the product, the price, the exchange rate, the border procedures, and right. everything that you require. And I think that one is quite fundamental and critical Th in bridging uh, the gaps in terms of demand and supply. Thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, Waziri Cabinet Secretary uh, Munya, I come to you now. And, and you've heard all the comments that have been shared. Um, I, I want to come to you with a specific focus on inclusion. That, that, that we must ensure that this move does not leave anybody behind, that we move forward together, that the rural and urban together are able to leverage opportunities offered by digital. And, and how do we strengthen the scope for value addition as well? Please share your views on what you are doing, um, what is transformative, what can we learn, how can we partner, please. Yeah, thank you, <clears throat> thank you very much. I want to, to say really that uh, Inclusion is, is, is the, um, the elephant in the room <laughs> because we've been improving over the years. Fiber optic cables are here. Uh, technology companies that are at the cutting edge are also here. But you see, you see a lot of our rural areas, the poorer segment of our population still left out uh, in this digital divide. So, so the real challenge here is to see what really we need to do in terms of coming up with innovative strategies and the policies that are geared towards bringing those who are left out into the, the digital divide. And, and if we are talking about trend, for example, we need to think about the small, micro and medium enterprises. How do we bring them into the network so that they can also be able to participate and be able to grow uh, in e-commerce. And, and, and one, some of the, the innovations that have been done to deal with the cartels, we talked about cartelized trading, is, is for example, what we want to do in terms of creating uh, commodity exchanges uh, that opens up the market and uh, lets the best prices be you know, accessed globally by, by, by those who are trading. Uh, the other uh, intervention we are making, and I, I hand somebody already 
allude to it, it's, it's also having those who are really specialized. The big companies also set up here to help in terms of those bigger logistic challenges that the small enterprises may not be able to, to do on, them, on themselves so that they can be able to, to link themselves on the value chain and ride on the bigger, bigger, you know, bigger enterprises that already have the wherewithal uh, to do. And, and, and in our investment promotions, we've met many that are coming up. S uh, some of the giants that are already here, like uh, the ones that have been talked about, and others that are coming that are heavily involved in the global value chains that was set up. So, so government pushing those who have specialized in these areas to come also set up and, and be part of assisting deal with this inclusion is, is the issue. But uh, of course, issues of costs, governments bringing costs down. You can see we have done, for example, here in Kenya, a big effort in the last mile connectivity on, on um, electricity and also accessibility to, to, to the fiber optic and the internet. But because costs have not gone down tremendously, few people are left out. So we have to think in terms of how we can see you continue bringing costs down to enable uh, people connect. We are also uh, already here uh, operating on a single window uh, for our institutions that are involved in trained facilitation. And we have made uh, sure that all institutions participate in a single window, all government institutions, so that you, you know, those who are uh, in uh, trading can and do it quickly without having to go to too many and deal with too many institutions. Again, uh, we've given, uh, we have given deadlines on, on when uh, this system is supposed to, to be completely operational. We've given like, uh, given country two months to make sure that uh, the system works effectively. And, uh, uh, you know, everybody is involved. Then uh, the issue of trust. I, 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 I want to agree those who have thought about those key trust is, and the issue of guarantee uh, schemes that would enable challenges of trust and um, be dealt with. And, and, and we are actually working on, on, on a system with even our financial institutions in Kenya on how government can be able to to, 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 to kind of uh, uh, you know, ensure that uh, particular percentage of where the risk is in terms of, uh, you know, government takes over the risk base. So some kind of guarantee. Guaranteeing that base so that uh, uh, the small and micro enterprises can be able to access credit, access technology, and those who are providing that technology are guaranteed by government for that risk element that they may not be able to meet. Uh, and uh, of course, really, you know, this, uh, as, as many have said, this we, we also have a, require a lot of mind shift in our regulatory institutions, in our own culture, now we do things so that we deal with the barriers, because some of the barriers are mental. The, uh, we can do technology and do all these things, but you see, you see challenges at our borders right. when you do that, even, uh, even when you have done all the interventions. Right. And the issue also. We are doing a lot of uh, investment in capacity for, for the SMEs, building their capacity for them to be able to, to participate, and also assisting on how we can build institutions for aggregating the produce that they have so that they can be able to access the market and be able to sustainably pro supply those markets once they, are, they have access to them. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and part of that mind shift, part of that emancipating ourselves from mental slavery, uh, a very big part of it sits in government. <laughs> and so we appeal to you as much as possible. We need help in breaking that down. I'm coming to the floor now. We, were, we are running short of time, but I do want to make sure we take some questions and comments from the floor. I love sharing African proverbs, and there's one that says, uh, no matter how many times you milk a cow, it cannot produce butter. So what I'm asking for is what should we be doing? What are the strategies we should be adopting? Please don't bring questions to the panel, bring suggestions. I see your hand, I'll come to you in a moment, but I'll start with the gentleman who is here from um, the postal perspective. Sir, introduce yourself and tell us what role do you have to play as post offices? Thank you. 
Well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Bishar Abdurrahman Hussein. I'm the Director General of Universal Postal Union. And listening to the panel's uh, speeches yesterday, today, the President's speech, I think we are very good at analyzing the problems, but uh, very short on coming with proposals and solutions. This is the biggest problem we have. And so what is your solution as the Postal Union? <laughs> we have a solution called Ecom Africa. And I'm going to uh, explain that uh, in detail, but it is a one-stop shop. And you go, when you have a headache, you go to a doctor. When you are, have an accounting problem, you go to an accountant. But when you have a delivery and logistics, which is the backbone of this e-commerce business, you go to the post office, please. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. So come to us. We'll show you how it's done. And we have been doing this for ages. Thank you. You get a Thank round you. of applause. You get a round of applause. Uh, the lady uh, just behind, please. I see your hand, sir. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Nenna. I come from the internet. I was invited as a digital citizen. I'm speaking on behalf of myself. The part, the bigger chunk of the mental slavery is that someone is sitting in Uganda and is devising pro products that you want to sell to people in West Africa, and this person has never put a foot in West Africa. So we have people sitting in their countries imagining what is going to happen. What I want to do is to be able to have Rolex from Uganda for breakfast when seated in West Africa. I want to dress up in the Rwanda attire for a good event somewhere in Southern Africa. I want to be able to have my Indabela wear while in North Africa. Can we please begin with free movement so that Africans can visit Africa Thank and you. see the true value? Thank you. Thank you. And, and the beautiful Rwandese dress is called the Mushanana, I think. It's uh, absolutely beautiful. And the Nigerian headwear. <laughs> ah, there we go. Aha. Gentlemen, just over there at the back, and then I'm going to come this way and that way. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Mohamed Bakhit. I'm from the Permanent Mission of Sudan in Geneva, Coordination of Africa Group in Anictad Matters. Uh, let me first to thank uh, our panelists and for their insightful. Uh, from my perspective, I think the realization of the CFTA will be one of the uh, solutions because uh, I hear from uh, most of the panelists and even the interventions from the floor that uh, if we accelerate the free movement and the uh, many of uh, articles that already on the CFTA, now we are meeting here and our uh, senior trade uh, officials and the ministers will be gathering ministers of uh, trade of, uh, from Africa, will be gathering in Cairo uh, tomorrow and after tomorrow. I think this will also advance uh, the realization of the CFTA and it will be uh, one of the solutions for us. Thank, thank, you thank you very much. We need to breathe life into that document. I'll take the gentleman on that end. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, hi, everyone. I am Andrew Akelo Omogo. Uh, I run uh, a media company, a small media company called uh, Olives Media, where we use um, technology, media, and innovation to solve some of the pressing or complex public uh, policy challenges. Um, for more information, you can go to uh, Impact Kenya, impact-kenya.com. It's live right now, and you can check. Okay, was My, this a marketing, or did you have a contribution? Yes, I have a contribution. Okay, please, I was introducing briefly, myself. Briefly. Yes, uh, mine is straight to Waziri. Uh, Waziri, we like Ajira Digital, but uh, as much as we do like it, we want, uh, we don't, we don't prefer that. Or okay, that is for me that the government gets involved directly in creating projects. We want the government to form uh, to create the enabling environment. For example, provide proper legis uh, legislative framework to protect innovation, that is one. And two, create direct specific funding and pitching spaces for the youth interested in running digital businesses and ideas. Thank you. Three, uh -huh. prevent politics from interfering with innovations, especially in the, in the spaces of democracy and human rights. Uh -huh. Four, provide lower cost of data and strengthen the 
already existing infrastructural framework, which, uh, and five, empower the rise and thrive of digital villages. Thank you, thank you. Points all well noted, thank you for that. I want a lady, yes, I have a lady. Interpreters regret to inform the room that uh, having worked for an additional 10 minutes, interpretation time is finished. Thank you. Of Kenya. Mine is a quick uh, recommendation to the uh, cabinet secretary. If the ministers of the region can work together, we can be able to facilitate e-commerce because there, there are challenges between the East African Legislative Assembly, especially, and the Kenya National Assembly and the respective national assemblies of the different East African member states that make it so difficult for ICT infrastructure to be built across the region. If we do not have an enabling ICT infrastructure, then e-commerce has no platform on which it can operate because it needs the internet. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for all your comments. I wish I could go on. You will miss lunch if I do. So I apologize. I'm going to come back. And um, I'm going to come to our government representatives and Frank Mastart first. The, the final question that was asked was, can the ministers across East Africa work together? And, uh, you know, my sense is that if one part of Africa, if one regional bloc gets it right, the others are able to follow suit. And so, Waziri, um, you know, Assistant Commissioner, and, and Frank, from your perspective, why on earth? Can East Africa not just get together and resolve that we can start this here and, and we can really transform Africa with an example from East Africa? I'll start with you, Aziri. Uh, Julie, you are, you, are, you are preaching to the converted. Uh, I think governments are working together, really, if you, if, you, if you follow what governments do, in, even in the meeting, you see that uh, Sometimes the challenge is not lack of policy or lack of what needs to be done. What lacks sometimes is the good will or the political will to move to that next step. Uh, uh, and therefore, Why? Uh, to give Why? an example, I, I will give yeah. you uh, the Northern Corridor uh, integration project has moved quite well in terms of dealing with these particular challenges, making even payments uh, interoperable in the region uh, and bringing even core, cost of cost down. Uh, and I think that is uh, something you would say government has really facilitated, but even to reach there has not been easy. Uh, because what I'm saying again, we need to all change the mindset that uh, for us to grow the world that we need to grow, create jobs, we have to trade. And we can trade and make it easy to trade. And uh, removing barriers, both physical and regulatory, is very important. Right. So beyond, you know, right, building roads, bridges, and all that is very, very important. But even after you've done that, you need to move to the, the next level, removing other software. The, the software. software and bit of it must also be undressed. Okay. And um, I think the framework has been worked on. The next thing is to go implementing it. Implement, which is our, our worst disease, yes, our worst condition. Indeed. Frank, please, your thoughts. I mean, I, I think just building on what the CS has just said there, we, we, we live in a world that's becoming increasingly nationalistic. And, and I mean, I think you can see uh, what's going on in the global trends. I, I think we re need, really need to avoid that here in East Africa. I am concerned that people seem to think that if somebody does well out of trade, somebody else is doing badly. Well, trade lifts all boats. And I think that's really important. And yes, I couldn't agree with you more. I'm afraid it is in the realm of politics. But the technical solutions are possible. Yeah, to answer your question, absolutely. And you're also preaching to the converted. <laughs> Malcolm, you wanted to come in here. And then, Richard, I'll come to you. Yes, uh, just to pick up uh, on the critical issue of trust, uh, ITU is in the business of developing international standards to ensure interoperability across borders and interconnectivity. It's been doing that for a very long time. So we have a lot of standards on PKI, uh, security, customer protection, privacy. Um, we have a group now with the World Bank and the Committee on Payments and Market Infrastructure supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, actually working specifically on standards for this area. 
So we don't see a lot of participation from Africa in the development of those standards. So I really would encourage more participation. It's free of charge. You, you don't have to be a member of ITU even to join that group. And the, and the next meeting will be in Cairo, 22nd to 24th of January. Thank you. Can I just ask, do you have to be a member state or can private sector organizations join? Any interested party can join that uh, group. Excellent. Thank you very much no for charge. that. No charge. Thank you. Wow. Richard, please, your thoughts on this. Uh, can we do it as East Africa? Can we start? I want to assure you that we're already doing it. When I am here, I don't need a SIM card for Kenya. I use my Uganda number. And the call cost is the same as I'm at home. That is great. To cross here, I use my national ID. I don't need a passport. So that is great achievement. And then I think lastly, in terms of currency convertibility, we are there. I don't need to first go and buy the dollars in order to come here. I come with Uganda shillings and I convert it in straight away into Kenya shillings. I think if the whole of Africa can adopt and move that far as the East African has moved, then I think we'll achieve a great deal. Wow, that's powerful. Can I also say that our new passports in East Africa <laughs> How many of you have the East African passport, Republic of? Yes, our new passports are East African Republic of, which, which is also pretty amazing. I want to come to all of the entrepreneurs, everybody who spoke earlier. I, I really want you, in your final comments, to, in, in a way, speak to the stakeholder you would like to engage with or share the message that you think is most important right now with this room of, of multi-stakeholders here. And maybe, Chris, I'll start with you. Leave us with your parting shot. What would that be? Well, my, my parting shot is, you know, um, don't wait for government. Um, if you can, do it yourself. What um, I experienced is with Mall for Africa, we help people bring stuff in. Um, there was this drive, so what could we do for Africans? There's Alibaba for Asia, but what is there for Africa? So creating an online community where Africans can put products on the platform and they can sell it to the rest of the world. So what we did is we came up with a platform called uh, Marketplace Africa um, and in partnership with DHL we've you know, pretty much created a platform where anybody can put African made products. We don't want your iPhones. <laughs> we want African made products. Put them on the site and you can sell them to people abroad. That is just one step. You know, we're, we're just one organization but to say to yourself, I can do something. I don't have to wait for somebody to do it and do it yourself. That's the mentality of an entrepreneur. Um, that's what we've done. And my speech to everybody is, look, try and find something you can do to make a difference. We have found, um, founded Marketplace Africa. Try and do something on your own. Make a difference. Government will support you if they see that what you're that doing you are successful. can do something successful. Right. Thank Absolutely. You. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that. Nicola? Um, I think a lot of great ideas have been exchanged today, but I think if I had to leave with one uh, final thought, it would be that uh, Africa will leapfrog not only directly to e-commerce from informal retail to e-commerce, but actually will directly go into a structure of full integrated marketplace. And to echo the sentiment or the, the, the trying to solve the, the, the gap between rural areas and central cities, the answer will, will not come from a big either private actor or a big government action that will make it happen. It will be the coordinated effort of thousands, of millions, that are going to aggregate around the technological solution to provide it. And Jumia is already one example of this. If you take Nigeria, for example, the logistic system is fragmented, cartelized, as has been mentioned. To overcome this, Jumia has brought together 127 as we speak, and we are recruiting five every month, small logisticians. Five bikes, ten bikes, two trucks. They can't afford more, they don't have the capital for more, but that's already enough to start servicing the needs of Jumia customers. And those 127 are today the ones transporting the millions of products that Jumia sells every month. Mm. The power of marketplace is huge. It's going to be the, the way forward for Africa, and I think for regulators, we see in every country we go, regulators don't yet understand the concept of marketplace, or at least have not translated it in legal text. Right, right. We are not, Jumia doesn't sell. Jumia is a go-between between a vendor and a customer. And that three-party relationship is not translated in regulations today. 
Right, thank you for that. So both of you, uh, Chris and, and, and Nicola, have told us, you know, just move ahead. You can find solutions. Some of those solutions will be very local in nature. And then government will hopefully catch up. And we must not lose sight of the fact that we need government to create policy that works for these environments. But in the meantime, let's keep moving ahead. Uh, let me come to you next, Dylan, please. So thank you very much. I, I think I've I want to first say there's a, there's a saying that says, uh, whilst when is the best time to plant a tree? And the response is yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And I think that's critical here. We've, we've had, we're working in a, a world of unknowns. Um, and there is fear that comes with that because we do not know how things are going. So we're trying to have policy lead innovation or is it innovation leading policy? And we, we really have to bring the stakeholders together like we are doing here on a consistent basis. Um, so thank you to UNCTAD, European Union and African Union for doing that. In terms of trust, there is one thing that came out uh, as, a, as a solution, as a parting shot, because that is kind of the... the, the the top of the pyramid for everything that has to do with, uh, with e-commerce, whether it's B2C or B2C or B2G and vice versa. And this came out of the summit yesterday. And I just want to uh, read this out. The CEO summit calls for national, regional and continental harmonization in buyer and consumer standards and the adoption of a code of ethics specific to digital trade and in line with global standards. As part of this, we call on the adoption of a pan-African e-commerce trust mark and the development of harmonized e-commerce specific customer complaint mitigation processes. And that is a big drive from a private sector to say, we are, we've got to look at how we serve our customers and how we then work with government to create those standard processes. And I think that will really go a long way to improving trust. Thank you very much for that, Dylan. Thank you. Very constructive. Uh, Anna, please. Okay, my final words would be to really address um, a lot of the challenges we face, speaking from the perspective of entrepreneurs on the continent, right, and innovators, it's important to have um, the government and development agencies and other stakeholders sit on the table with these entrepreneurs that are out on the field every day, with the tech hubs and other stakeholders that are supporting the entrepreneurs and startups in the e-commerce sector to build enabling policy frameworks. Now, beyond the building of the frameworks and the setting up of the beautiful policies, we actually do have quite a number of really good policies on the continent, is the implementation. So action, 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 basically following through with it. Um, and then, there, of course, um, Dylan mentioned that and Chris as well there's really a great need to collaborate more um, what we find a lot is that you know there are a lot of individual initiatives are being uh, uh, developed and pushed but it is time to come together and consolidate on all our efforts basically um, and then in terms of j just to address a comment on the in terms of strengthening the the postal service it is very important as well for every single stakeholder across the value chain of e-commerce to also speak to entrepreneurs to understand the challenges um, just a quick example I just remembered an entrepreneur um, within one of our hubs who delivers uh, uh, beauty packages across the nation in, in Nigeria. And she complained that the cost of her packages are actually more expensive because of the handling, basically. So speaking to the entrepreneurs would also help, you know, the National Postal Service to improve their services for e-commerce businesses. And that way she doesn't have to, you know, increase the cost and transfer it to customers, which reduces her customer base, you know. So, um, yeah, so important for all stakeholders to listen to the challenges being faced, um, for government to co-create the policies with the, with the entrepreneurs on ground um, and other support, enterprise support organizations um, as well on the continent. Thank you very, very much. Alan? Uh, so my parting words, um, I was in Nigeria recently and the CEO of EcoBank made a very good presentation, but one of the things that hit me was a stat he threw out. By 2030, or whereabouts, 80% of the poor people are going to be in Africa. So that means extreme poverty is going to be an African thing. And he said about 80% of those 80% are going to be in Nigeria and DRC. And, and that, that really hit me like, like a rock. And, and so I see the digital economy as the strategy to make sure that that doesn't come to pass. So I implore African, everyone, right, to make it their strategic mission to bring everyone into the digital economy. 
And that is actually our mission at, um, at Sente. We have a mission to bring 100 million Africans into the digital economy. And so if you're in the room, you're a tech company, in payments, in e-commerce, you have APIs, we would, we would like to collaborate with you to make sure that we do not miss this revolution. We missed the industrial revolution, we missed the information revolution, we cannot miss this one. Thank you. Thank you, Alan, thank you. I'll share another interesting 2030 statistic with you. 921% is going to be the increase in mobile subscriptions in Africa by 2030. 921%. Nowhere else in the globe does it even come close. And if that is not a business opportunity, I don't really know what is. So, but thank you so much. Jessica, you have the final word. <laughs> Thank you. So, so far this week, we've spoken about an interconnected Africa, pushing e-commerce into the forefront of the continent and making it easy to buy and sell online. But there are some countries in Africa that actually don't have any online payment gateways or ways to shop online, and we don't think that's good enough. Today in Botswana, uh, Botswana is an example of this. There's no national switch or payment gateway, and consumers have to pay through banks or go through mobile operations, which can be quite expensive. If we want to empower African nations, Af African nationals to shop online and start their own online businesses, we must focus on the fundamental basics of what online shopping is about, and that's having the ability to pay online. As an Alibaba and Unctad e-founder, and as a textiles company as well, on Clasher, we accept currently four different African currencies without the need for separate localized current, uh, country, country websites. I look forward to the day that I won't have to integrate five or six APIs just to accept 10 African currencies. So if I'd say today to the banks and to the policymakers, look at getting your African countries connected online, make it easy to shop online and make it easy for people to receive their goods as well. Thank you. I want to thank all our panelists. Let's give them a better round of applause, please. Thank you all very, very much. A very enriching discussion. I do believe we break for lunch now, and we will be back later in the afternoon with much more. I just want to leave us with a thought that Africa is a thriving marketplace. It really is. And once we start to tap into that and understand that, we will find solutions to the challenges that we are dealing with. My final word, please collaborate, share, learn, partner, because together, if we don't work together, we can't achieve anything. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.